It's great to um, have uh, Dr. Angela uh, Bradbury back here at the University of Chicago. Dr. Bradbury trained here as a resident and a hematology oncology fellow. Also trained uh, with Mark Siegler in medical uh, ethics. She's now an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania in both the um, uh, hematology and oncology division, but also the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy. And those of you who are at her uh, Grand Rounds uh, lecture knows that she's interested in um, looking at uh, how genetics um, really um, influences uh, our ability to communicate to patients, how we should communicate to patients, what we should communicate to patients and families about uh, genetics. Um, and it's really becoming more and more of an issue as these tools become available, not just in hematology, oncology, but uh, throughout uh, medicine. I don't know how many times uh, in the last uh, couple of months I've had patients come to me with their own genetic profile and ask me to explain what does it mean for them and for their family. And so this is becoming part of uh, our medical armamentarium, and we need to know how to communicate and address that. So we can have this as a relatively informal meeting, so I'm sure uh, Dr. Bradbury would be happy to take uh, questions and comments uh, during it. Um, but let's welcome Dr. Bradbury back to the University of Chicago. Thank you. It's very nice to be back. I was saying all day that it feels like being home. So it's a great pleasure to be here. And um, as some of you may have been to the noon talk where I was talking about um, alternative models for delivery of genetic services, and I'm going to be touching on some of the same studies, but what I decided to do for this talk, particularly with the mission of the Buxbaum Institute, is to really focus more on how we developed our communication protocols and what some of the skills are and strategies that we use when communicating by alternative modes, such as telephone, video conferencing, or if we're thinking about taking a patient-physician encounter and converting it into a web-based visit, which is not with a provider. Um, but can still be interactive and can still have a lot of benefits. I don't know if we'll get through all of them, but um, it was really nice for me to go back and look at some of the stakeholder data that we did. So a lot of what I presented today were our randomized, kind of rigorous quantitative studies. But behind every one of those studies was at least a year or two of work with qualitative stakeholder um, interviews as well as some other audio tape review and other methods that we use to develop the communication strategies. And so those are some of those details are what I'll be presenting today. Um, let's see. So as I shared earlier, and everyone knows, genetic testing is standard of care um, in oncology and also in many other areas of medicine. Our traditional delivery model has been in-person pretest counseling. You sit down with a genetic counselor or another clinician who has expertise in genetics to review the benefits, risks, and limitations of genetic testing so patients can make an informed decision about proceeding with genetic testing. And this was really, you know, came out of the model from Huntington's disease and then was utilizing cancer genetics for BRCA1 and 2 testing. And this is really our informed consent process for genetic testing is this pretest counseling. And then patients, if they elect to proceed with genetic testing, then return for a disclosure visit where they receive their genetic test results. Again, the tradition has been to do that face-to-face, -to, -face, to be able to make sure patients have a good understanding of their results, and to make sure that we can provide the psychosocial support, particularly if they receive what would be considered more distressing results, such as a positive genetic mutation. And this has traditionally been delivered um, by a genetic counselor and then a physician comes in separately or a nurse practitioner to discuss the medical management issues. But we know that this two-person in-visit model is not going to be sustainable for the future. I mean, even for BRCA1 and 2 testing, when you look at larger populations, and the one here is from the ABOUT study, um, which is a, a study out of Kaiser, and 37% of patients in that setting who had BRCA1 and 2 testing actually met with a genetic counselor. But the data suggested the benefit to meeting with a genetic counselor, those that did, had higher knowledge and satisfaction with services after receiving their genetic test results. And so we already know that there are a lot of barriers to receiving genetic services and genetic counseling, and our genetic counselor workforce is really limited. 
Um, we are never, with a number of emerging genet genetic or precision medicine applications, we're never going to have enough genetic counselors to be able to provide genetic counseling for every patient. And there are large populations or subsets in, in the USA where genetic counselors are just not physically um, available. So we've been looking at remote delivery models to fill this gap and provide access to genetic services. And we're now starting to ask the question, particularly as um, somatic testing has come out, tumor profiling has come out, do we really need traditional genetic counseling for patients to make informed decisions? Or are there some groups where maybe um, they could achieve this either with other types of practitioners or alternative delivery models and kind of triage um, to genetic counselors those particular cases, patients, or types of tests where it really demands a one-on-one -on -one, um, person visit. So this means that we have to rethink our traditional visit, um, not just sitting in the clinic and um, having that face-to-face -face communication, which I will say when we've queried patients about different alternative models, I will say that when possible, they generally prefer to meet with a person in clinic. But there are all kinds of reasons why that may not be feasible for them or why some of these alternative models will, would be of interest. Um, so phone is one of the models that we've looked at, and I'll share some of the data from our cogent study and the communication models that we developed for that. Video conferencing is something that we've been doing for the last about seven years, and we have a telegenetics program. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we very recently beginning into web-based, which are not provider-mediated, but completely web-based alternatives for genetic education and informed consent. So one of the challenges in genetics is that things are moving incredibly fast. So the cost of sequencing has come down immensely over time. And it's now the case that it's not technology that's holding us back from offering genetic medicine in the clinics, but in many ways knowing what to do with the information and how to deliver it. That is creating the greatest challenge for us now. And in cancer, as well as other areas, we've really moved um, to have a variety of new applications. One of them is multi-gene panels, so these are um, additional cancer susceptibility genes beyond BRCA1 and 2 and beyond TP53, the ones that we commonly think of, including moderate penetrant genes and some of them um, lower penetrant genes or some that we have relatively limited information about. And we can um, offer panels of four genes, six genes, 20 genes, 40 genes. There's all kinds of testing options now and not a lot of standards in the field. And the testing um, options, therefore, are much more complex and there's a greater risk for uncertainty. And um, many of us feel it's very important for patients to understand that if they're going to embark on genetic testing with multi-gene panels. And then, of course, many are familiar with genomic tumor profiling, so the goal here is to look for driver mutations in individual cancers and match to, um, match to a therapeutic target um, you know, that is um, driven to that particular genomic mutation. The utility of this remains unclear in some settings. So in some settings, there's very clear clinical utility, but testing all tumors for a wide variety of mutations is still um, uh, considered an endeavor with unclear clinical utility and is being studied in many precision medicine trials. It's not to say that there's not a lot of this going on clinically, um, despite the fact that many would argue that we haven't proven clinical utility yet. And ASCO recently updated their um, genetic testing policy statement because of these new um, testing capabilities and continues to endorse the importance of pre-test counseling. So talking with patients in advance about what testing you're ordering, the benefits of it, which I think we all cover pretty well, but also the limitations of the testing and the potential for germline mutations or inherited information if you're embarking on tumor profiling which won't come up very frequently, but can come up. And, and when I say not very frequently, that's if you're looking at a tumor-only platform. If you're doing a um, tumor and germline platform, then you may have a much higher frequency of identifying germline um, inherited risks. So really still a strong endorsement for having those discussions in advance of testing. And really what this represents in the field, for us, you know, I said it's, he was getting, not boring, but the field had gotten a little stagnant. BRCA1 and 2 testing had become standard of care. Um, you know, we have you know, a lot of providers ordering it. You weren't necessarily having patients meet with genetic counselors anymore, and there wasn't a lot happening. But right now, um, things have really kind of exploded. 
in cancer genetics. And there are many, many options for testing and not a lot of standards, um, clinical standards to go by. And really this represents a change that's happening across medicine where we're moving from single gene or discrete testing to multi-gene or bundled testing and even whole exome, which would be considerably, considerably um, broad testing. And with this change, it's really challenged us to think about how we're communicating with patients about genetic testing. It was, you know, the, the traditional comprehensive model was to talk with someone about BRCA1 and 2 so you can say, well, these are the risks that would be associated with having a BRCA mutation and these are the medical management options that we would consider if you have a mutation, doing what in the counseling world, world is called anticipatory guidance. But how do you do that for 20 different genes? when it's, well, if it was this, you would have this, and if it was this, it would be this, and this, it would be that. There's just no way to cover that in the same way. And so when we had been doing, um, and I'll, I'll actually come back to that point, this is just a highlight for you what these multi-gene panels look like. Some may be very familiar with these, but for others, I mean, there's a range. These are just a range of some of the genes on um, this one particular panel. Some of them are associated with very high risk for cancer, similar to BRCA1 and 2. Um, and then others have a moderate risk, may slightly increase the risk for cancer. And many, if you wanted to be a critic, would say it's not clear that knowing you have that mutation actually changes anything above and beyond what the family history would have already suggested anyways. And then there are others on these panels where the muta the, there's not a lot of evidence about what the risks truly are. So a certain amount of uncertainty that patients would need to be prepared for. And... Um, in some cases, we have very good guidelines for what to do if you have a mutation, but then in others, um, guidelines are still emerging. And if anyone's looked at the recent guidelines for like CHECK2, some would even call into question whether those are truly appropriate and accurate. There have been for ATM and CHECK2, there are now recommendations for colonoscopy at 40 if you have one of those mutations based on very little data. So there's you know, a lot of controversy about what the right medical management is with some of these particular genes. And so I, as I mentioned, it's really when these panels became available, we had to think about how we were going to counsel patients. We really had to change what we were doing. And one challenge for us was that we were in the midst of conducting studies looking at outcomes um, with genetic testing. And if you're doing a study and looking at outcomes, you need all of your providers to be using a general similar approach. And so it challenged us to get together a series of genetic counselors and genetic counseling uh, cancer genetic teams to come up with what we thought was a reasonable approach. It's not to say it's the only one, but to talk with patients about multi-gene panels. And really, you know, what we wanted to make sure was that people were understanding what they were getting into and the limitations and the risk for uncertainty. Because if you are unprepared for results, you're more likely to experience distress or have negative outcomes. So with this in mind, we developed what we call the tiered bin model for multi-gene testing. And this was published in Genetic and Med Genetics and Medicine in 2015. And again, we did this because we had several ongoing studies and we needed all of the genetic teams, cancer genetic teams, to have some sort of consensus on how they were going to approach patients. So we had six different cancer genetic programs. University of Chicago was one of the programs included. We had the physicians, clinical geneticists, and genetic counselors all combined on several conference calls to talk about how we were going to adjust our model of counseling. So there had been some work done by um, others looking at a generic consent. And this actually had been a, a strategy that had been considered even in the prenatal setting as well, where a consent, and this is in contrast to a comprehensive consent model, comprehensive being you share all the risks, very specific details about what those risks are for each individual cancer and what the medical management strategies would be. But many have argued that that's too complex for most people. And for most people, they actually may it may actually um, hurt their decision making to overwhelm them with too much information. And that an alternative strategy might be a generic consent, which is trying to minimize informational overload and tailor the, the counseling to a wide range of informational needs. And the strategy with a generic consent is to come up with what are those things that a person, uh, you know, any person or every person who makes this decision needs to understand and if it, just those minimal elements, 
And then recognizing that some people may want more in-depth information and you can still provide that. Um, so we call this the tiered bend model because the tiering is the tier one information is information that everybody should receive and we want to make sure that every person really understands the tier one information. And then the tier two information is information that's available for someone who has need to better understand specific risks, maybe specific cancer subtypes, exactly what you're going to do based on, you know, if a mutation were found. So again, tier one, indispensable information. And the binning part is putting, rather than giving people information on all of the high-risk genes, saying, for example, on these panels are some high-risk genes. If you have a mutation in one of these, your risk for cancer are much higher on the order of 60 to 80 percent, similar to BRCA1 and 2, which is what we call a pullout. And so using sometimes one example, but not saying if it were BRCA1 and 2, there would be a risk for breast and ovarian cancer. If it was TP53, it would be a risk for sarcoma, adrenal cancers, it, which is just more information than people may need to make the decision that they need. Um, and so that's the bent part. And this was a model, again, we went back and forth on what are those you know, key elements that people need to know. And there were some areas of consensus and some areas of controversy. So to get started, what we did was we took the key elements to come up with what were those indispensable elements. We took the key elements from ASCO's 2010 um, genetic guideline recommendations for key things that people need to understand. So information on specific risks, specific risk reduction options and limitations, and you can see the rest of the list here. And then we took each of those and said, is this something that we want to share in the same way we did, or do we want to apply our tiered bin model to it? So you can see for information on specific risks, this is one that we said we need to really tier this and bin it for people. And that's just that example, um, instead of giving people specific numeric risks for each cancer type, we're going to say there are um, risks for a wide spectrum of cancers and a wide range of risks. Some, t some of the genes are associated with high risks. Some of the genes are associated, mutations in genes are associated with moderate risks, which may increase your risk just slightly. And then you pause and use some of our other strategies to see if people want more information or not. And so that was our approach. And this is where we had, you know, the debate about what, you know, what we needed to, to convert to tiered and bin and what would just be usual practice. So that, you know, psychological risks and benefits are pretty similar across all these genes. There are some nuances that people felt we really needed to pull out. So we came up with the seven essential elements for informed consent. And there was consensus among the counselors that in contrary to the prior comprehensive model, we did not need to take every patient through Genetics 101 for them to make a decision about proceeding with genetic testing, which is honestly very different than the, the old model of the traditional flip book and you want to make sure they understand inheritance and, you know, the uh, concept of penetrance. It's not deterministic. And so it really was a, a change in, in the traditional model. And then tier two information is provided as needed. So a critical component to this model or generic consent is recognizing that people have different informational needs. And so one of the key strategies to this, which really was endorsed by our clinical psychologist on the team, was this concept of inf assessing informational needs, understanding, and emotional needs. So if you're using the model, it is extraordinarily important to check in with people. And we have specific probes in our research studies that counselors are encouraged, highly, highly encouraged to use. So if you're going to give people just an overview or a binned information, it's important to check in with them and say, does that make sense? Do you have any more questions? So then you can see if they need additional tier two information to be able to make their decision. Um, and the same way, emotional probes. So it can be, um, and this is something that probably we should have been doing in all counseling, but extraordinarily important when you're talking about complex information is to ask people, how are you feeling? You know, is there, does this make sense? Is this distressing? And a lot of times we rely on what we see across a patient's face. Um, but we developed, we actually started with these um, probes when we were doing telephone counseling because across the phone you can't see that. But what the counselors started to appreciate, and I think I've even started to appreciate in clinic too, is that sometimes we think we know how someone's feeling and we may not really have gotten that right. 
And so when we started using our telephone communication protocols and encouraging counselors to using these probes, they also had communication um, protocols for the purposes of research and fidelity that they would check off when they were doing the face-to-face -face visits. And they were encouraged to use them. And sometimes they would learn that that blank face that, you know, that they were seeing wasn't distressed but was actually being confused. Or they thought the patient was confused, but actually the patient was feeling distressed. And so there, there are things that can be used even in um, regular clinical encounters and are particularly important if you're going to move from a comprehensive to a generic consent. The other component that's really important, and certainly this is not a novel concept, the teach back is something that's used in education, I think used a lot in clinical psychology as well, which is asking a patient at the end, um, tell me in your own words you know, what you learned today and how you're thinking about this decision and what, the, you know, what genetic testing would mean for you. And it's a really great opportunity to clarify what people know and don't know. Very hard to convince providers to do. The genetic counselors say, it always feels so awkward, like I'm quizzing them. And so um, Dr. Patrick Miller, who's the behavioral scientist on um, all of this work, was really good at kind of working with them to figure out strategies to be able to still encompass or include the teach back. And I didn't present the data today, and I'm not sure that I have it in this slide set either, but in one of our early pilot studies, we did find differences in outcomes based on whether counselors were using these probes or not. And that's some of the additional, that was one of our pilot studies. We have all this data in our larger studies and some of the work that we want to do because everything we've heard from patients and some of our other um, audio tape reviews suggests that these are very, very critical. But it's hard to convince providers to always use them. And then we also, many of our genetic counselors, this was an area where we didn't have consensus, many of the genetic counselors felt that we really needed to use pull-out examples so patients truly understood what they were getting into. And um, the common one is, um, you know, some of these genes have a high risk for cancer, and we may be recommending prophylactic surgeries to you. And some of these prophylactic surgeries, um, you know, are, are, can be ones that would be fairly significant. And so people know mastectomy. People know oophorectomy, but the genetic counselors often want to pull out CDH1 mutations associated with an increased risk for diffuse gastric cancer, and that if you were to find a mutation in one of these genes, in, in this gene, we would be recommending that you consider gastrectomy or removal of the stomach. And a lot of counselors really felt it was important to understand, for patients to understand that. The other tricky piece that we've seen in multi-gene panels is that particularly with something like CD, a gene like CDH1, is now we're starting to identify CDH1 mutations, sometimes variants of uncertain significance, and sometimes the labs don't agree on whether it's a variant of uncertain significance or a pathogenic mutation, which is another challenge that can come up. But sometimes we identify these mutations in families that have no gastric cancer and no lobular breast cancer. And in that setting, it's very hard to know whether you should really recommend to a patient a gastrectomy when there's really no evidence of risks in the family. Um, so there, just to point out that these multi-gene panels have created a lot of angst for clinicians. And what we feel is important for patients to understand is they need to, un to think for themselves whether they can handle uncertainty. And if they can't handle uncertainty, I still encourage, and a lot of the providers um, in our program as well, encourage them to stick to a nor more um, narrow panel where we have very clear guidance and say, you know what, you can maybe consider those other genes in the future. And so it's really trying to help patients assess whether, you know, what their tolerance is for uncertainty. So after we develop together this consensus for what our tiered bin model should be, that's certainly not enough. For us and all of our stakeholder work, and you'll see some of it in the telephone counseling as well, we always conduct the pilot study and get provider and patient feedback so we can refine our model. So we took our model, and in a single site study at the University of Pennsylvania, we conducted the Meteor study. The aim of this was to utilize patient and provider feedback as well as audio tape review to refine our genetic counseling delivery model for multi-gene cancel panels. So to look at this tiered bin model and see what we need to modify based on experience um, with patients. It was also to, pro to obtain preliminary data and point estimates for um, future studies. The participants in this study were participants in two ongoing studies that we knew we were going to start incorporating multi-gene testing into. One was the Cogent study, which is our registered randomized study of phone versus in-person disclosure of genetic test results. 
had just started recruitment when uh, gene panels came out, and we knew we had to adapt our study to um, include um, panel testing. And the other was the longitudinal meteor study, which was looking at panel testing in patients who had had BRCA1 and 2 testing and were negative, but still had very strong family histories. And they would be really good candidates to look for other genetic mutations that may be explaining the um, cancer in the family. <coughs> So we recruited both patients naive to testing, where we were offering them the opportunity to receive just BRCA1 and 2 testing or a panel. And I say just BRCA1 and 2 testing or you know, it may be just TP53 or whatever the family history indicates, but targeted testing versus a panel. Or like I said, BRCA1 and 2 negative. So the methods for th considering um, how to refine our model included Qualitative feedback from patients and providers, so providers just telling us, you know, this was a disaster, this is how it went, uh, you know, I think we need to change this. Or um, qualitative data from patients about, I found this very distressing, I find it very confusing, the section on this wasn't very helpful and I'm not sure what it all means. As well as an audio tape review. So all of the sessions, both the pre-test and post-test counseling sessions, were audio taped in the Meteor study. We would do purposeful sampling by results, so the intent was to make sure we reviewed audio tapes on a certain number of positive results, make sure we reviewed some audio tapes with uninformative negative results, variants of uncertain significance as well. So making sure that we had covered all of those different testing outcomes. We also selected those who, um, using our a measure of informed choice, had made less informed choices according to the data outcomes. And then we had predefined criteria for tape selection. Again, I mentioned if um, we looked at open data where patients or providers may have made suggestions for change, but also if a patient indicated or a provider indicated a session that was particularly complex, we would pull that one for audio tape review. And then we looked at the summarized change scores and we selected the extremes, which I'll show you on the next slide what that means. And we used all of that. We had a behavioral scientist, a communication specialist who re reviewed all of the audio tapes for these select cases and then made recommendations and modifications to the counseling model. And actually, she didn't do that by herself. She would take, bring her observations to the group and say, this is what I observed. How do you think we should approach this or refine the model? The group did not listen to their own recordings, except there were a couple times that genetic counselors asked to. And sometimes they asked after she gave the feedback if they felt that perhaps they had struggled in that component, sometimes they wanted to go back and listen. And for all of our studies, um, you know, particularly when you're doing a randomized study with an intervention, you really want to make sure that there's some fidelity. And there's this tension between having a real world study. We have 22 genetic counselors. They are all going to have some differences in how they counsel. And I, personally, I think there's a benefit to that because it's more generalizable. But we also want them to be using the same general strategies. And so, um, you know, there was a training that occurred for all of our genetic counselors in each of these communication protocols. And they had to do a mock session. So whether it was telephone counseling, video conferencing, tiered bid model, each of the counselors would go through the training, do a mock session, and get feedback before they were actually able to participate in the study. And that was a very important component for um, maintaining some sort of standardized approach in a randomized study where you're evaluating outcomes. Not to say that, I mean, there's a wealth of data that we'll be able to look at and we're starting to look at even now in where the variability is because we know there's variability. Um, and sometimes it matters and sometimes it doesn't. So as I mentioned, we had these pre-selected criteria for selecting audio tapes to review. And when we applied our criteria, our, our goal was usually to review at least a third of the sessions. In this study, we reviewed a lot more because we just had, there was a lot of variability in, uh, and less overlap in some of the predefined criteria. But as an example, we reviewed five tapes with positive results, and she did both the pre and post. Um, one um, session because the provider requested and said this was just an impossible session and I couldn't stay on track and it felt like it was going all over the place. I'm not sure the person even understood at the end. And so would you review that one because there's something we can learn from that encounter. Any qualitative patient responses? There were 13 uh, qualitative patient responses that indicated some concern about how the session went um, and, and two on the disclosure end. And then as I mentioned, we had outcome data um, looking at knowledge, anxiety, depression, cancer worry, satisfaction, pre and post after each counseling session. 
and we looked at the change scores that were kind of like the lowest 10th percentile or the worst 10th percentile. So declines in knowledge or satisfaction that were in the lowest 10th percentile. Kind of like these were the worst outcomes. Let's go back and review those tapes. And for anxiety or your affective outcomes, it was the ones that had the greatest increases. So what happened in that session? It may be patient. You know, it may be about the patient, but they, but they, it certainly was a reason to review the session and see if there was something that the provider could have done differently to maybe try to minimize these outcomes. And then all patients classified as making a less informed choice were reviewed as well. And the audio tape review revealed several things. And I can't say this enough times, and this is one of the reasons that I really, it's so strange to say there's a value to web-based education. But one of the things that we heard over and over and over from patients, and we saw over and over again in the audio tape review, and it's totally not surprising, but it's hard to get implemented, is the importance of the visual aids. So you know, the old flip book that genetic counselors used, incredibly effective. There was a reason they designed it that way. But what happened was as counselors, just like all of us as busy clinicians get into clinic and they have a whole panel of patients to see, they're less, they became less likely to use the visual aids over time. And yet we heard from patients over and over again, and Dr. Patrick Miller saw it in the audio tape review, that when the counselors used the visual aids, patients did better. And a lot of patients have said it helped, and there's a lot of data from education that seeing really helps understanding. If you're hearing and seeing, you have a better chance of understanding complex information than just using one of your senses. Um, variability in the needs for tier two information. The, the counselors were pretty accustomed to a comprehensive model, so we're still giving people a lot of information. And the recommendation was dial back, start with a little bit. You don't need to do the comprehensive model. So some of that was kind of you know training yourself to use this new model. Minor modifications in the organization of tier one, so putting costs and options up front. Patients don't want to hear about that at the end. They actually wanted to hear that and did better when they were told that up front. I'm going to present a bunch of you know, testing options to you. You can do just BRSA 1 and 2 testing or a whole panel, but setting that up front as framing the discussion is helpful because then everything you say after that, they're like, okay, so I'm going to have a choice. And they're telling, you know, she's telling me about these choices. And then there are minor modifications to delivery, which we also um, hear a lot in the video conferencing and telephone. Use more lay language, not overly complex scientific language. Slow down the pace. Um, pause. Use the teach back. Again, a lot of um, counselors feel like it's very awkward. And use the check-ins and the pull-outs. So check in with your patients frequently when you're talking about complex information. And so after we had made these revisions to the model, I'm not showing you the outcome data because it was the pilot study, and I'll show you some more data from Cogent. We then used this model in the longitudinal meteor study of 250 individuals who were BRCA negative and had the option to receive panel testing. And this study actually just finished, so we're looking at that data now. The RESPECT studies, which I introduced earlier, these are two studies where we're returning genetic research results to patients who have had our BRCA1 and 2 negative, but had given a biospecimen for additional gene discovery research. And in the context of research in the lab, mutations were identified in these other panel genes. And um, so these two studies were developed to think about how can we actually return genetic research results back to patients? How should we be doing that? Um, which has been a controversy in the field. And then the multi-site cogent study, which is the telephone versus in-person delivery of genetic test results. So I thought I would just share the data from um, the uh, Cogent study. I shared the overall data today um, in the grand rounds. And we met non-inferiority for all affective outcomes, saying that telephone is no worse than face-to-face -face for disclosure of genetic test results for anxiety, satisfaction, and affective outcomes. We failed the test for non-inferiority for knowledge. But there, you know, that's a pretty, uh, using a non-inferiority standard is a pretty high statistical test. And if you look at whether one arm was superior to the other, there were no statistically significant differences. Um, but what, what I'm presenting here is the data just for the multi-gene panel testing patients. And again, by arm, there were no differences, which I shared today. But we were interested in those who received multi-gene panel testing versus those who decided to have targeted testing.
because a lot of people in the field were concerned that those patients who go on to receive more complex testing will have worse outcomes, right? Because it's much more complex, there's more risk for uncertainty, so maybe they have more uncertainty, maybe they have more distress. So in Cogent, which had 22 genetic pro providers, again, using this tiered bin model, 395 per, um, participants were offered multi-gene panel testing, so their pretest counseling included the tiered bin model. And 95% of them actually proceeded with multi-gene testing, but a s small percentage elected that uncertainty was no good for them and they wanted to do targeted testing alone. And after adjusting for baseline differences, there were no significant differences in short-term changes in cognitive affective outcomes between those who had multi-gene panel testing and those who had BRCA1 and 2 testing. So suggesting that if you use this model, your patients will fare no worse if they have panel testing than if you have BRCA1 and 2 targeted testing. Um, and that's actually a really significant finding. This data has been pu uh, presented in abstract form at ASHAG just recently, but has not been published yet, but will be really important for the field. The caveat is, is that we're using a specific counseling model. And um, you know, in the real world, there is considerable variability, and everyone may not be using this model. And um, it, it takes some training and getting used to using all the probes, et cetera. All right, so how about communication by phone versus video conferencing? What are some of the strategies that we've used in both of those settings? I presented earlier you know, the rationale for using phone. I won't spend a lot of time on that, but I did want to talk about how we developed our telephone communication protocols because I presented the cogent study, but in doing that, you know, I present the randomized study, but what it's missing is all the years of development work that went into developing the communication protocols. So in 2008, we started stakeholder interviews with genetic counselors. Some of them had already been using telephone, so we asked them, you know, what are, what are your concerns about using telephone? Why do you, what are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? And when you've disclosed results by telephone, what were the, you know, what were the outcomes? What were the experiences for you? And that was really important to informing our communication protocols. We also conducted interviews with patients who had gone through standard face-to-face -face genetic counseling and said, hey, if you did this by phone, what do, you, you know, what do you think would be the advantages and disadvantages of that? And that's what we used to develop our initial telephone communication protocol. These were some of the advantages and disadvantages. They're not surprising. Everybody endorses convenience. Um, this is a really interesting one, which I talked um, with the students about last night, but we actually designed our cogent study as a non-inferiority study because we thought that phone could only be worse than face-to-face, -face, right? Like, how, there's no way it could be better. There's no way that could be. What's interesting is that the phone visit is with a genetic counselor with a recommendation to follow up with a clinician in clinic at a later date to review the findings and the medical management. And that's, first of all, because we were already having trouble getting billing covered for counselors, and we knew it was going to be no better for getting a physician on the phone, and it would be hard to sell to any institution to say we should be on the phone all the time and not generating any RVUs. So we just decided that wasn't going to be a model that would work. And that's also what we had heard from genetic counselors, that when they were already doing genetic counseling, they were generally doing it without a physician and recommending the usual clinical follow-up. If they received the usual care, they met with a genetic counselor and a physician. The standard of care was genetic counselor and then physician. But patients had told us, you know, it'll give me more time to prepare for my discussion with the doctor. And what we found when we actually implemented the studies, we did a pilot and then we did a randomized pilot. And what we heard from the physicians, um, one of my colleagues at Fox Chase, he said, oh my god, these sessions are so much longer if they've already had a phone disclosure. My call. That was his comment. He said, they're taking, like, they're clogging up my clinic. They're taking so much longer. And then we talked about, he's like, yeah, but I think they are asking really good questions. And so it dawned on us that we probably might have even been able to call this, you know, frame it as a superiority trial with the longitudinal data because of this simple fact. You can think about in the clinic, if you learn BRCA1 and 2 results, then you have someone keep talking at you about risks and prophylactic mastectomy if you want to, and at some point you need to remove your ovaries. People kind of shut down because they're affectively adjusting to the news. And there's a potential real benefit that patients had shared with us 
in breaking apart this information. And, and, and it's exactly what Mike said. When people came in, they had great questions because they'd had more time to think about it. So that was something that we thought was really interesting. And it, actually here, it suggests that providers were sharing that more than even patients. But we did hear a lot in the qualitative data from patients as well. And then the disadvantages, what I thought was interesting here, was per communication was this concern of providers, not as much so for patients. Decreased patient understanding was a real concern by providers. And patients were much more worried about the emotional or kind of personal support. So just to recognize that providers and patients may come to the table with different concerns going in, and you want to make sure that you're addressing both of them. And again, how do we address this? Those emotional probes. How are you doing? I don't hear anything. It's silent right now. Let me give you a moment. But when you, when you can, let me know what you're feeling. Do you have questions? Or do you just need some time? And so, you know, really having to check in more to make sure that we're addressing this. So our telephone disclosure communication protocol included visual aids, highly endorsed by patients, not used frequently enough. Um, standardized communication topics, um, which at this point was for BRCA1 and 2 testing, so we we're just making sure that all the counselors are covering all the topics. And then, of course, this really important part, which were the provider probes. And now remember, this was for telephone disclosure. So we had standard probes, which were the emotional knowledge probes that I talked about earlier with tiered bend approach. And that was because patients and providers told us that they were really worried about that. And then we had situational probes. And these were the most fun to develop. And the way we did it was we, when the counselors participated, we had a pilot study of about 95 patients who all received their results by phone. And then we had a randomized study, so it was like another 100 patients who received their results by phone. Um, we asked the counselors to tell us what events came up that they were unprepared for, right? So a couple of the memorable ones, person yelling at their children, you know, and so you just want to think in advance of like how you're going to handle that because you can't control the setting anymore. When you're in the clinic, it's a controlled setting. But if a patient is on the phone, all kinds of other things can happen. GPS going off in the middle. <laughs> Would you like to pull over? <laughs> it appears that you may be driving your car right now. And there were all kinds of very interesting distractions that came up. And so we developed kind of this probe book of, or situational probes, all of these situations that came up. And then we would think in advance, like the counselor would say, well, this is what I said, but I think next time what I'll say is this. And then they would be vetted by everybody. And so then in the counselor training, the counselors would go through a lot of these and read them in advance so they were prepared for the scenario, which just allows it to flow much better. So that's one of the biggest things that came out, in addition to the visual aids, um, and then the knowledge and emotional probes, and also these situational probes for um, telephone. And then provider training, which I already mentioned. Um, so then again, our refinements were based on these predetermined criteria where we selected audio tapes for a review. And that's where some of these situational probes came up as well. We reviewed 38% of the tapes. Again, there's a list of the different criteria. And the primary refinements um, from these pilot studies were setting patient expectations. Um, it's going to be about you know, at least 20 minutes. Have you set aside the time for this? Um, because again, you can't control the setting. And one of the, you know, some of the counselors talked about they felt like they were rushed, like patients were trying to get them off the phone, which was a new experience for them because when you're sitting down, it's usually you that's worried about the next five patients and maybe rushing the session. But sometimes a patient is rushing it because they kind of fit this in between a couple other things that they were doing or someone just came to their door and so they want to get you off so they can go, you know, talk to um, their neighbor or whatever it may be. Um, refining the visual aids, there were some things that were confusing. You know, doing visual aids where you can actually, if someone looks at you, they give you a funny look and you know they don't understand, you can talk about what they don't understand. It's a little bit harder by phone and so there were some things in the visual aids we had to change. And then several additional situational probes and provider training. Another thing that um, came up a, a lot was getting used to silence and being okay with the silence. So when you're doing phone counseling, and we do this naturally when we sit in the clinic, the patient, patient gets upset it's very natural to just kind of pause, right, and give them a minute. But when you're on the phone and there's silence, you don't know what that means. And so it's good to be comfortable with the silence, but then ask that follow-up question for what your eyes can't see. 
Um, I shared the data from the randomized study earlier, so I think for the sake of time, um, I'm going to go on. So these communication protocols were used in this very large randomized study. It was a multi-center study. University of Chicago was one of the sites. We recruited over 1,000 participants undergoing cancer genetic testing at five clinical sites. All of this was real-world testing covered by their insurance. None of this was covered by the study. They were randomized to telephone or in-person disclosure with over 400 in each arm. And this was presented at ASCO this year, and the publication is under review right now. And as I mentioned, phone is no worse than in-person disclosure for the affective outcomes that failed non-inferiority for change in knowledge. But what I wanted to get to, um, and I'll tell you, I mean, how we're looking at this is telephone is certainly a reasonable alternative to in-person counseling, even in the era of multi-gene testing. But we should recognize that some patients have strong preferences for face-to-face -face counseling, and we always want to, if possible, maintain the opportunity to allow them to come in for a visit. We need to be attentive to the potential for misunderstanding because of this finding that we failed non-inferiority for knowledge and encourage clinical follow-up with a physician. Um, and recognize that the outcomes may differ, differ if people are using different counseling models. I wanted to talk briefly about video conference because in developing our communication protocols for video conference, we encountered different challenges. And telemedicine and video conference, I don't know how it's being considered at the University of Chicago, but there are some institutions that are even way ahead of us. I mean, I know Jefferson has a really big um, mission for telehealth in Philadelphia. And so their doctors actually do a lot of video visits now, and, and it's kind of part of their expected clinical load. Um, and so some institutions have really you know, moved this forward at a faster pace. Um, and there are a lot of potential benefits to video conference. It, over telephone, it provides that face-to-face -face communication. It is preferred by patients. We ask a lot of hypothetical questions in a lot of our studies because we're always thinking about that next phase of research, and that's great preliminary data for a grant. And when we've asked people about phone versus video conference, they always prefer video conference because people really do value being able to see a person. But video conferencing is more co costly and more um, expensive. Uh, more costly and also more challenging or complicated. It's increasingly used so socially. People are using Skype to communicate with relatives, and so this may be more, um, you know, people may be for more familiar with it and comfortable with it now. Some of the challenges, and some of these have dissipated over time. It requires secure technology platforms. You should not be doing medical care by Skype or FaceTime. It can feel less personal um, or it, it can feel intrusive, particularly if people are not very technology savvy. Um, the disconnections and disruptions and technical challenges could be frustrating. And there's a risk for misunderstanding. It may be more challenging for positive or variants of uncertain significance and there are issues with licensure and billing. So this is the model that we were using, and I'll try to wrap up in the next couple minutes just so that we can, can answer any questions that people have. We have a genetic provider at the University of Pennsylvania, or Fox Chase, who's sitting in front of a computer, has audio and visual, and it's a real-time video conferencing. So a patient at a community center, these are all community centers that didn't have genetic counselors on staff. A patient and a nurse are at the other site, and then they connect in real time to conduct the same visit that they would have otherwise. Same care that we would provide in the clinic. So we used our telephone communication protocols as our infrastructure or our baseline for adapting these. And we did a pilot study of 10 patients um, in a surgery clinic. And what we learned several things. We needed to address up front the potential for technology disruptions. So saying up front, it's possible that we may be disconnected and this is what's going to happen if we do. Because when, we didn't hap when that didn't happen, um, by the time patients got back on, our behavioral scientists could see how distressed and confused and kind of perplexed they were by this whole like event that happened in the middle. But if you share with people up front that it might happen, they you know, adjust very well to it. Um, what the plan is if you're disconnected or if the, um, the screen freezes, which happens. Um, and then one of the biggest things that we noted was that, and, and one of my counselors who is doing the randomized study of phone versus video conferencing told me that she likes phone better for exactly this reason. And you guys may see this in Skype, but if you're Skyping with someone socially, you're, you are looking at them. But for a genetic counselor who's trying to take notes, this is kind of a problem that um, clinicians can have with the EMR as well. They're trying to draw the pedigree and then look up. And when they're looking up at the patient, it, they're not always making eye contact because they're not looking in the right place. Or they're looking down too much. 
And so the counselor recently told me that she liked phone because she didn't have to worry about her eyes and where she was looking. The other piece is the nice thing with video conferencing is the visual aids you can actually pull in and put on the screen and minimize the person, right, the view. But that takes a lot of like, you know, you got to be toggling and moving and different platforms have different ways of doing that. And so that can create challenges as well. So most of what we are adapting, a lot of the other strategies were very similar. But we did have to make some adapt adaptations for video conferencing. And the only other thing I would say, training, 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 practice, practice, practice. Our counselors who do this all, all the time are much more comfortable with it than those who go between the clinic and do it one day a week. And so it, it is really a skill that you develop. And I imagine there'll be a day where providers will be training in you know, how you do these types of visits just as much as face-to-face. -face. So I'm just going to pause there and see if there are questions or comments or suggestions or thoughts that anyone has in the audience. You said don't conduct medical care. Yeah. But isn't that really what's happening? Uh, with, with, and I'm not necessarily saying it's bad, but I mean, isn't that what you say, for example, they're doing in Jefferson or whatever that they're conducting? But in, in some ways, this is too. But You, you know. have to have a secure platform. So make sure it's a HIPAA compliant video conferencing platform. Not so much the fact that you're not really doing the patient in front of you. Right. When I said don't do it by Skype or FaceTime, what I'm saying is that those are not HIPAA compliant platforms, and so you have to have a HIPAA compliant platform. Now, what I've heard it, as a counter, which is a good one, is, well, we call patients and talk by phone, and we don't know that phone is HIPAA compliant and who's, like, you know, tapping into that. But follow-up care is different than, like, if you're following up on test results. Um, but if you're doing something that you would do in the clinic, um, if you ask the Office of General Counsel, they're very concerned about privacy and making sure that if you're taking a visit, a whole visit, and doing it by telehealth, that you're using a HIPAA compliant platform. And so that just means you have to find a HIPAA compliant platform. We have used about five different platforms. And of course, the genetic counselors are the best ones to speak about the pros and cons of each one. It's a lot of fun work to try new platforms. Yes. Home, we have not tried yet. No, we're, we, we want to because for some patients that, you know, even reduces accesses, uh, access barriers further. Um, but getting platforms to work at home and through firewalls can be a challenge. Now, there are firewalls at home, but firewalls on the institutional side can be hard. And getting the platform up and ready in the home can be hard. Now, I've heard a lot of people do it successfully. But at this point, we've still been doing it at a site. And part of that is if they proceed, they need to provide what used to be a blood draw. And it also permits that someone sees the sample being taken. And so there's always concern with genetics about chain of custody and who's providing the sample. And so that was another reason that we've kept it at the site. But there are ways to account for that. And in some cases, um, we do the phone counseling in the home. We are going to pilot doing some of the video conferencing in the home. But at this point, it's all been at the site. Many other centers do not have genetic counselors doing intakes. Um, they actually resource that to other professionals and reserve the counselors for counseling. So we have um, a coordinator who does the intakes. Um, we're using in our telemedicine program, we use the online progeny. So we try to get as much family history as we can online. But otherwise, there's a coordinator at the site who obtains the family history. The genetic counselor reviews it. And sometimes we'll reach out to the site and say, hey, it'd be really important to get the pathology results from X, Y, and Z, or ask so-and-so to clarify this. But they're not doing the intakes. The first time they meet the patient is um, when they do the pretest counseling session. Um, Yeah, that's a great question. So the, for the in-person follow-up, so after someone received the, receives their results by phone with a genetic counselor, we were liberal in the randomized study to when that follow-up occurred. So for a lot of sites, if a patient received a positive result, they were able, you know, they would permit and, and modify the schedule or make sure that someone could get in quickly. And if a counselor is getting a list of questions by email, they would usually try to get the patient in quickly to see a clinician. 
Um, and so that's how we approached it. That can be hard sometimes, though. I mean, schedules can sometimes be very full. So we, were, we didn't set that follow-up at like three months so that people had to like, you know, torture themselves with this information before seeing someone. It was meant to be real world. If someone needed to be seen soon, they were seen soon. And if others didn't feel that same urgency, they were kind of given the time that they needed. I mean, it, the interesting, when we did our stakeholder work for our video conferencing study, and it's from the physician standpoint, so let me step back. When we were thinking about our remote counseling model, we had to find community sites that did not have genetic counselors on site. And we started with stakeholder interviews with each of them, on each of these sites. And we interviewed a provider, a nurse, and a business administrator about how they would feel about doing video conferencing. And what we heard from most of the doctors, we interviewed, I think, 22 different sites. Some of them just didn't want to do this at all. And so if a patient came into them, they were going to refer them. And if the patient didn't go, the patient didn't go. So they were never going to get testing, and they, and they are having it available, it would be great, right? Some of the doctors don't want to do it, but they will because they don't want the patient not to get the testing. But how much of a discussion they have is not nearly probably as comprehensive as a genetic counselor would have. And the about study that I showed earlier was in the Kaiser Permanente group. They had looked at all the patients who had had BRCA1 and 2 testing and asked them if they met with a genetic counselor. So they, all these people had had testing. It was like over, I think, 1,000 people. Only 37% of them reported that they had met with a genetic counselor. So it happens a lot. And in that study, they looked at knowledge and satisfaction, and those that met with a genetic counselor had higher knowledge and greater satisfaction. They don't have behavioral data as to whether people made the right medical management decisions, so we don't know that. But a lot, you know, most of the data that's out there, there was a big push many years ago um, before panel testing, and I wouldn't encourage this now, but there was a big push towards thinking about whether primary care physicians could be doing BRCA1 and 2 testing and gynecologists and just doing it in their office, and there was a lot of interest in that. Um, but most of the studies that have come out and shown data on that, uh, you know, particularly when they're not um, kind of randomized studies or um, but more real-world studies have shown that the outcomes are not as good. And, and, I mean, it's a lot to ask. I mean, understanding of variants of uncertain significance, uninformative negatives, what testing to order. A lot of times when testing is ordered, there, there is some data that when testing is ordered by a non-genetics professional, there's a lot more over-testing. Um, and so there's, you know, that, there's some data to really validate exactly what you're, what you're experiencing. And so that's why this is a nice model to be able to provide access to genetic counselors for patients who um, are otherwise have not been able to have access. A question? Yeah, so it's a good question. One of the things that I haven't shown, we had five institutions that were participating in the cogent study when panel testing became available. And it was interesting, if you look at how many patients were offered panel testing, it varied widely among these five institutions. I will say Penn was one of the real slow adopters to panel testing. We liked the sequential approach. Let me look at the family history. You look like breast ovary. Let's just do BRC1 and 2. And then if it's not that, let's go down our differential diagnosis. But the argument on the flip side is that patients get fatigued by our sequential testing. And that from a cost standpoint, you can run all of them for the same cost, which I would never suggest that's a reason to burden someone with uncertainty that they're not prepared for, which is why I think it's important for patients to think in advance whether they can handle this information. Um, and then some patients or some providers also were worried that they would only get one shot for testing and that, um, you know, that their insurance company um, was not going to be cover sequential testing, and so they really only got one shot. But what was interesting in the study is if you look over the – we have three periods of about, I think it was like six months each, where we had panel testing. And the sites that were early adopters and offered almost everyone panel testing started to experience the pain of variants of uncertain significance. And then their panel testing rates went down. And the slow to adopting sites like Penn, where we were like, I don't know why anyone would want to do these harebrained panels. Why don't we just think about the patient in front of us and the family history? We were really low in our panel testing, but we started to inch up because we recognized the value and, you know, for particular patients. And so all sites kind of evened out by the end. Um, it's still a very good question.
Um, I don't know that the field has resolved that. Um, ASCO's guidelines, um, I'm biased, I sat on the guideline committee, but when we talked about this, we still really made an encouragement for providers to feel comfortable doing targeted testing. You don't have to order a panel because a lot of providers not, not in academics felt that they may be held liable by a patient if they didn't order something. And so when the testing companies come to advertise the panels that they have, some providers were feeling really compelled that they needed to order them because they were available and they didn't want to withhold something from patients. So that was put in the guidelines to really tell people you can order targeted testing, you don't have to do panels. Great question. It's a great question. Um, it's funny because we, we talk about, it's been such an interesting place in cancer genetics with all these testing options. And you know, one day we, we sit in the workroom and we're like, what are we doing today? Yeah, today we're thinking that panels are a good thing. You know, but then the next day, you know, like you're, we don't even feel like we're always consistent in what we're offering, at least in the early days. But the labs have helped a lot in some ways. Um, so one is there are some labs which will allow you to do a custom panel. So you get to customize, you, you can leave off CDH1 because everyone's had a bad CDH1 experience and once you have that, you don't want to order a panel. Talking to people about gastrectomy when there's no gastric cancer in their family really sucks. And most people just don't want to have to do it again. Um, so having a custom panel is really nice. The other thing that they have um, developed are the reflex testing. So you can order BRCA1 and 2 testing, but if it's negative, then to reflex to a smaller panel, like a high penetrant panel, or a broader panel based on what your patient preferences are. And that's been a really nice strategy because I will tell you in the Meteor study, we had a number of patients who had BRCA1 mutations but had a whole panel ordered. And that really wasn't necessary um, because if you had done a targeted approach first and then reflex to a panel, you really could have avoided all of that. Um, so it's a good question. There are many more options that the labs offer and the counselors um, it's a really, I think, an important time if you're going to be ordering multi-gene panel to partner with a genetic counselor because they're the ones who know how to get it covered and what the different labs are offering, um, and that's been really helpful. Thank you. It's really been a pleasure to be here, and um, I appreciate the opportunity.